Uh, good evening, everyone. We appreciate your attendance at this event. Uh, we hope you will enjoy it. This series of lectures aims at listening to some of the most renowned language researchers in the world talk about their research and their concept of meaning. This helps us all expand our knowledge and vision of language and communication. Now, we will present a general introduction of today's lecturer's background. Good evening to everyone in the Western Hemisphere and good morning to everyone in the Eastern Hemisphere. We are delighted to welcome you again to our distinguished lecture at Escuela Nacional Preparatoria 3, Justo Sierra of the UNAM 2020-2021, The Meaning of Meaning. Today's lecture is Prof. Professor Richard Ivory from the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Richard Ivory works in the field of cognitive neuroscience. His main interest revolves around action mm -hmm. and skill movements. In one of his courses, he reveals quite provokingly that he would argue that the brain is fundamentally a navigational system. In other words, we have evolved our brains in order to comply with the inherent needs of motion through space if we were to survive at all in a wild world. Professor Rich is currently the director of the Cognition and Action Laboratory of UC Berkeley, where he and his strong body of collaborators carry out research projects on behavior and cognition, including visual, auditory, and time perception, language and speech, and motor coordination. Mm -hmm. Their experiments incorporate a combination of behavioral, perceptual, and cognitive tasks with both healthy participants and clinical populations. They use new imaging techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, as well as non-invasive brain stimulation. For instance, transcranial magnetic stimulation. In some, Professor Ivory investigates cognition and action with an emphasis on how people select actions, learn skills, and produce coordinated movements. His publications include as diverse topics as mechanisms for sensory motor learning, subcortical contributions to cognition, action selection and response preparation, as well as neural mechanisms for temporal processing. Professor Ivory completed his BA in psychology in 1981 in Brown University, his Master's of Science in Psychology in 1983 in the University of Oregon, and his PhD in Psychology in 1986 in the University of Oregon as well. Professor Richard Ivory has authored and co-authored almost 300 scientific papers in renowned cognitive neuroscience journals. Professor Ivory co-authored with Michael Gassaniga and Ron Magnum, a very influential book, Cognitive Neuroscience, The Biology of the Mind, which is already in its fifth edition. Also, Professor Ivory has received numerous awards and he has won quite a number of research and teaching grants by the National Institute of Health and other related organizations. So without any further ado, we welcome Professor Richard Ivory to our series of distinguished lectures. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, uh, nice to see so many people at a, a virtual uh, experience here. Um, I will say that um, I've had trouble getting my undergraduates to show up regularly since the lectures all get recorded. Uh, first, they used to show up for the recordings, but over time, they've all opted to like go to the recording. So it's nice to have a big crowd and I, and I wanna uh, take advantage of that. So I want to encourage um, people to ask questions at any time as we go along. Uh, I'm trained, I am a cognitive neuroscientist. We have a little dog fight going on in the other room. Um, but uh, it must be uh, dinner time. Um, but uh, uh, what did I want to say? Uh, I am going to talk, you know, a little bit of false advertising that just went on. And that is, um, 
I have studied language some, but it, it isn't actually a, a main area of interest. I keep circling back to it because it's so fundamental to human behavior. But if you do look at the recent papers from our lab, we don't talk that often about language for the last few years. So things I'll talk about are, are a little bit uh, uh, dated, but I think they're still quite relevant. Um, but so, so again, um, as a language researcher, uh, that's a little bit of a stretch, I would say here. Um, and uh, we do use many of the different methods of cognitive neuroscience in our research, brain imaging, brain stimulation, et cetera. But uh, at the heart of it, I am a cognitive psychologist and I'm interested in how the mind works. And I, the, uh, the brain imaging work tends to be very important, I think, for understanding where something is taking place in the brain. And that's very important information. But uh, as a psychologist, I tend to find the uh, behavioral work to be the most interesting in many ways. Um, and some of the work will be with people with uh, unusual uh, neurological conditions. And there'll be a bit of work about uh, using physiological measures such as EEG, but, but much of it will be about the behavior. And um, again, if you're not familiar with the methods of cognitive psychology, some of the experimental manipulations might seem a little strange. So you should just feel free to just interrupt and ask me about that. Um, so with that, that is a preface here. Uh, I will share my screen. And um, I'm not sure why keeps going to the end of the talk and not the beginning. So give me one second to jump all the way up there and you get a reverse coming attraction. Okay, and I can hide the floating controls. A year of COVID teaching has taught me how to uh, um, try to optimize the screen there. Um, so I, I assume you can all see the screen and you can all hear me clearly now. Uh, I might only see myself and, and Maria, but uh, she can give me a thumbs up if everything looks good there. Uh, I'll take it, it does. So uh, um, this is the uh, 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 title I chose for today about language and perception. Uh, obviously two very fundamental aspects of human cognition. And uh, the question is gonna be, uh, um, what do they have to say to each other? How do they inform each other? And I have to figure out how to advance things. So, um, so obviously uh, many people have thought about the relationship of language and thought. Um, now, as I shuffle things around, I, we'll probably have a little bit of an overlap there of conflict of that one picture. I can, uh, I won't worry about it too much, but if it gets in the way, I'll hide it. I usually like to have at least some human face so you don't see it though. Uh, I'm not seeing my own face. Um, okay, so, uh, um, so one extreme, if we think about that, might be that all of our thought is really determined by language. And there are certainly some very respectable philosophers who have actually advocated such a strong position. Um, Heidegger here, this one quote I really love, uh, man acts so He was the shaper and master of language while in fact, language remains the master of man. So really Heidegger is saying it's language that's really in a sense shaping all, all of our thought. Uh, I don't know how to control all the little things that pop up. I can keep hiding the floating controls and I guess I can admit someone since I'm a co-host here. All right, or Krauss, another philosopher made the same point by saying language is the mother of thought not its handmaid. So language doesn't function at the, uh, at the pleasure of thought but rather it, it, it serves, uh, uh, um, thought serves at the pleasure of language. Now the um, other extreme, oh, I gotta admit someone else, okay. Um, the other extreme would be uh, that language is just really one form of thought. And, um, you know, a starting point you could think about with that is that that would be implying that much of thought takes place outside language and indeed maybe even perhaps outside awareness. At least if we think that awareness and language are intimately related, which is some position I take. I mean, um, but certainly I recognize that much of what's happening in our minds, uh, perceiving, whether we're perceiving things or priming or even, you know, weighing different options in our desires is really taking place, you know, outside of language. We don't really have conscious access to it. And I would say that, you know, uh, that's kind of in a sense, I take it to be the modern legacy of Freud. Freud really put an emphasis on the importance of the unconscious mind. Uh, Freud put a particular spin on it in terms of how that uh, could lead to clinical disorders. I'm not gonna 
go into that that realm, but certainly I think he made very fundamental observations about the importance of uh, much of our mental life taking place outside of awareness and being inaccessible to language in that sense. Um, so if we take this as correct, right, that uh, uh, much of thought is taking place outside of language, then the question is, and the one I want to address today is this question about at what level does language influence the non-linguistic or the non-language aspects of our mental life? What's the interaction between the two? Okay, and, um, oops, I have to aim. And uh, this question, you know, at least in the linguistics and psychology world, uh, always leads to the famous Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, uh, frequently people just call it the Whorf hypothesis, and Sapir gets dropped a bit. Okay, and the, the core statement of the Whorf hypothesis, if you're not familiar with it, is the idea that the structural differences between languages will be paralleled by differences in the thought of the speakers of these languages. So, right, so we obviously know that there are differences across languages and how the languages are structured. Seems like every time someone shows up in the waiting room, I'm gonna have to click on those things, okay? Um, and uh, the notion is that because there are these linguistic differences, they're going to have consequences for how we think about it. And this is a quote here I have from Worf that basically summarizes that idea. It says, the categories and types that we isolate from the world of phenomena, we do not find them because they stare every observer in the face. That is, they aren't given just by the perception. On the contrary, the world is presented in a kaleidoscopic flux of impressions, which have to be organized in our minds. This means largely by our linguistic system in our minds. And so Worf saying that, you know, we're always, of course, going to have varied perceptual experiences, but the way we shape those perceptual experiences, you know, that's where that's what language is very fundamental about. It gives us those categories, those names for things or semantic meaning. We we can sort of put together the semantic meaning and, and the entity. And Worf saying it's that language is really going to shape that. And if we have different languages, that's going to be the important notion. If we have different languages, that might have implications there. And so a classic example people think about is uh, uh, we know that uh, people, indigenous people live in the Arctic, at least in some linguistic groups there, have many words for snow, uh, whereas most of us might have just a couple words for snow. I grew up in New England and, and I experienced a lot of snow. So, you know, I, I, I do have a few different words for, for snow in my mind that I'll describe different types of snow. <laughs> soft, oh, uh, uh, soft powder uh, um, and so forth. Uh, but someone, you know, like my kids who grew up in California, you know, snow might be snow in their mind. But we know that, you know, there's other languages where they talk about 11 or 13 different words that refer to different types of snow. So we know that conceptually they're thinking about the world differently. And the question is, though, is, that, you know, is, is it at the conceptual level or is this like changing the way they perceive the world? And um, one example, and I don't speak Spanish, but one of my favorite examples was given to me by a colleague, Lyra Borditsky, a friend. Um, she's worked with one of the folks I think who's spoken to your group, Daniel Casanzanto. And, uh, and she describes this to me. Again, this is secondhand because I don't speak Spanish, but in Spanish, uh, you frequently, uh, if you're talking about an action, you don't necessarily need to refer to the specific noun or agent. So for instance, I'm a clumsy person and uh, I could be at a dinner and I might knock over the bottle, a glass of wine and someone might say, or my wife might say in an exasperated tone, you know, oh, Rich knocked over the wine again. Um, but I understand that in Spanish, you know, someone might really say the wine was spilled, that the noun isn't always given or the agent isn't always given. And uh, um, that sounds very appealing to me because, you know, no blame is being cast in that situation, right? They're just saying, there is a event that's happened in the world. The wine has been spilled, but who did the spilling isn't a necessary an essential aspect or it's not conveyed by the typical construction in such a sentence. And so the question would be then, you know, if you ask people, you know, later on when this has been shown, you know, hey, uh, you were at that party where that wine was spilled, you say yes. Uh, if you ask an English speaker, they're going to say, ah, Rich, that clumsy Rich, he's the one who spilled the wine. And Spanish speakers, you know, perhaps they're not going to remember uh, uh, who spilled the wine. Uh, that's not really, you know, been coded by the language, and so that has consequences in terms of their thoughts or memory of the event. So that's, you know, clearly 
these linguistic effects happen affect our conceptual knowledge you know about how the you know indigenous people of the arctic conceptualize snow they have a much richer conceptualization and they've created these different words to refer to that we lack that in you know something like english or california in english at least where they don't have those multiple words so clearly there's conceptual difference but again, that fundamental question that really wasn't clearly spoken about by Worf, I don't think he really considered it at this level, but certainly subsequent to Worf, many people have taken up the question is, does language also change how we perceive the world? Okay, that'd be a much more fundamental impact. The way we speak about the world, does it change how we perceive it? And here's a, a modern uh, um, Worfian quote, uh, visual perception depends not only on what something looks like, but also on what it means. So Lupian, Gary Lupian and, and Michael Spivey are making, again, kind of a Worfian claim there, a stronger Worfian claim that language is actually changing how the world looks. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna give two examples today. I'm gonna give one example and then you guys are gonna tell me whether you wanna hear about the second example, depending on our time. And the first one's gonna be in the world of color perception, which is actually where much of the uh, Worf discussion has taken place over the years. Uh, and, uh, um, and the other would be in the domain of, of face perception. So two different perceptual domains where I wanna ask this general question about how does language impact perception? All right, so let's first talk about color. So here's a, uh, what these are called Munsell chips. They're different ways to describe different colors. They have continua that can go from one hue to another hue. They can also go in terms of the saturation. There's a third dimension, the brightness and so forth. Now. I could ask someone in English, you know, what is this color? And they're going to like, like say green, and I can ask them, what is this color or blue? Or I could say, are these two colors the same? Okay, and uh, um, they're going to say they're different. One's green and one's blue. Now, this sentence here, I don't speak Welsh either, but this would be what the sentence would look like if I was to ask the same question in Welsh, and I won't even try to pronounce it there. But the interesting thing is that if I ask what color is it, the English speaker is going to say, oh, this is kind of a green and this is kind of a blue. But in Welsh, people are basically going to say it's gloss, no matter whether I point to this one here or that one there. They have the same, they don't have color words that distinguish between green and blue. And this is true of many languages in the world, that the number of basic color terms varies widely. Some languages just have three color terms. Others might have eight or nine. So in English, you know, we make a distinction between green and blue as two basic color names, but in Welsh, they don't make that distinction between green and blue. And that's true in some other countries, but other countries, other languages like Russian, um, sorry, I just keep doing that, uh, actually have two different color names for, um, I'm, I'm dual tasking here, as you can see. I, or maybe you can't see, but uh, whenever someone comes into the waiting room, I'm doing the admit to them, and then I have to hide the floating controls again. So uh, forgive me for the distraction there. So the uh, uh, if someone else wants to take over um, regulating the waiting room, that would be great. But again, in, in other languages, uh, there might be two different words within the blue category. They make a distinction between bright, light blues and dark blues, something that's not made at the basic color name. So the question then, the Worfian question would be, so clearly conceptually there's a difference here, right? And someone in Welsh might think that these are, at least at the conceptual level, the same basic color. English doesn't make that distinction, but does it change how things look? Okay, that's that question about perception. Is it a conceptual impact or a perceptual one? And this is a classic study by one of my colleagues at Berkeley, Paul Kay and, uh, um, and Kempton, and they uh, went to a, 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 a Central American indigenous speaking group, the Tarahumara. And uh, it's another language that doesn't make a distinction between green and blue. They were, they were studying this group because of a number of interesting features of their language. Uh, but they have a single, like, like the Welsh, they have a single word for green and blue. They don't make that basic color distinction. Uh, Sionami, okay? And uh, what Kay and Kempton did is they would show, these were their four stimuli labeled A, B, C, and D. And they would show two colors at a time. So they might show the A and the B, or the A and the C, or the B and the C, or the B and the D. They would just present two color chips at a time. 
and they'd have the person rate on a 100 point scale, how similar are the colors? Now, because they had used that Munsell sheet, they knew that in English, these four colors are equally spaced psychologically. In some psychological space, if people were asked to say, is A as similar to B as C is similar to B, they found the colors that in English, you got a perfect spacing between those two. But the question was that since the Taramura speakers don't make a color boundary here, because English speakers will tend to call these two enforced green and these two blue, okay? If they're forced to come up with one word to name the colors, and again, it may not reproduce that well on the computer, but believe me, A and B are always labeled as green and C and D are labeled as blue. The Taramara lacking that distinction, right? All of these colors they would name as Sionami. And what Kay and Kempton know, uh, reported is that that lack of a color word changed the spread of these colors. So the Taramari actually tended to push these guys further apart. The B and C were pushed further apart not because they had the boundary, but because that equal spacing in English had actually artificially brought those things closer together. So the English speakers, so basically they're just saying that there's a difference in how the Taramaru and the English speakers rate the color similarity, okay? And it was manifest in this particular design that the B and C were labeled as more similar for the Taramaru because they lack that color boundary there. So this was a case that, you know, was high, widely cited as an example of showing how the words we use change our perceptual experience. But now you get critics who say, you know, and there's been lots and lots of studies at this, and it's a highly contentious literature, you know, where people are saying, is this really changing perception? And various people have offered critiques of that. They said, no, it's more about memory, right? We see these things or it's a strategy. Uh, Steve Pinker, uh, you know, someone who's thought deeply about lots of issues related to language. He has one kind of skeptic's position here. He's saying, okay, look, pretend you're in an experiment, right? And imagine how the subjects, the subjects, people doing the experiment, think to themselves. And they're saying, you know, now how on earth does this guy expect me to pick the things that go together, you know, if, if the question was, choose the two are most similar. So suppose we did that experiment, I showed you chips, all four chips and said, choose the two that are most similar. Pinker's saying, well, if he hasn't given me anything more direct than just which are more similar, well, if I call these two green and these two blue, then maybe I'm gonna pick the A and B or I'm gonna pick the C and D as most similar more often than I pick the B and C because they have different color labels. And Pinker's critique is that you might get these similarity judgments, not really because of a perceptual difference, but because of something like memory or the strategy effects and so forth. Um, and so uh, uh, that's where we got involved is that we decided, uh, uh, and this was a collaboration with Paul Kay, um, came out of our uh, just cognitive science group interacting, um, that uh, I was working at the time with people uh, who, um, I was interested in hemispheric differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere in a variety of different motor and, and perceptual tasks. And uh, um, we realized that we actually could maybe, typically these experiments have always been done between groups, right? We compare English speakers and Taramara speakers, or we compare Welsh speakers and English speakers and so forth. So that's always a between group contrast. But we thought given that language shows a strong lateralization, right? It's the left hemisphere seems to be much more important for language functions than the right hemisphere, right? One of the most basic tenets of neuropsychology or neurology. Uh, then the question was, would we actually see a difference between information presented in the right visual field versus information presented in the left visual field? And we're taking advantage of the fact that if you're looking straight ahead, Anything that appears in the right visual field is gonna get projected to the left side of the brain. And anything projected to the left visual field is gonna get projected to the right side of the brain. So if we are simplistic about it, we say that, look, anything getting to the left hemisphere is more likely gonna be influenced by language than stuff in the right hemisphere. Then we might see a difference within a given individual in terms of a perceptual judgments about things in the right visual field or the left visual field. So again, right visual field, 
It's going to be information processed by the left hemisphere, left visual field, information processed by the right. We're going to take advantage of that crossing. And then we want to have a task where we basically try to remove as much as possible anything that might be involved in memory or involved strategies. So we wanted to have rapid perceptual judgments. We didn't want to make language to be an explicit part of the task. So we wanted to, and by using within individual design, you know, whatever strategy they use, is going to be the same for things in the left and the things in the right visual field. I don't think people are going to say, oh, the stimuli in the left visual field, I should act a different way than when they're in the right side of space. So that was sort of what we wanted to set out is design a task that way. And this is what we came up with. Uh, it's a really simple judgment. We have people stare at this square. It appears on the screen briefly, so that captures your attention. And then we very quickly show them this grid of squares, this circle of squares. And we just simply say, you have to judge is the oddball, okay, we don't even say odd color, but it's obvious it's an odd color. Is that on the left or the right? So there's nothing about language. You don't have to say, is there a blue one out there? We don't have to refer to those color labels. You just have to say, is the display, that there's always gonna be one square that's gonna be different than the others. And is it on the left or is it on the right? And you're just going to press with your two fingers, you know, if it's on the left or on the right, we're going to measure your speed of your response, your reaction time. And we're going to use that to make inferences about the cognitive processing going on. So a very simple task, again, removing the strategies, removing the language, uh, and really removing anything about color explicitly. We're going to use computer generated matches to the same colors that Kay and Kempton had used in their classic study. So Two of the chips are labeled as green, two are labeled as blue, but in terms of psychological space, the distance from here to there and from here to there and from here to there is all equal. We're building up on a literature that's done that sort of what we call psychophysical scaling to establish the equality and psychological distance. So our experiment then really has two variables here, right? They make a manual response to indicate the side of the oddball. What we're going to manipulate then is this, the eyeball going to be in the left or the right visual field. And because it's a speeded response, we're going to assume that the response will be primarily driven by that initial activity in the contralateral hemisphere, because it's a simple perceptual task. They're going to be pretty fast RTs. So we don't think there's going to be a lot of interhemisphere communication. There'll be some, but we're, it's a tried and true method in cognitive psychology that you can get these laterality effects when you do brief stimulation presentation like that. And critically, we're going to vary that categorical relationship of the oddball to the distractors. It's either going to be drawn for the same classical category. So the oddball might be a green among a background of greens, among a bunch of greens, or it might come from a different lexical category. So now it would be that same green target, but now it's among a background of blues. Okay, so that's basically our experiment there. And here are the results. Okay. We got what we call a lateralized wharf effect. And I will say before doing the experiment, I had bet we wouldn't get this effect. Uh, laterality effects are pretty subtle. And Paul K, being the true believer in his work, uh, he bet that we would get this effect. So I was wrong and he was right. Let's first look at the left visual field. That's going into the right hemisphere, sort of the simplistic terms, the non-linguistic -ling hemisphere. And there's no difference, right? You're just as the time it takes you, about four tenths of a second. So this is all in milliseconds. So about four tenths of a second for you to be able to basically say that there's an oddball in the left visual field. And it doesn't matter if it's say a green among greens or a green among blues. There's no advantage or difference between the within and between category. But if we look at the right visual field, the language, you know, where the information is being projected to the left hemisphere, now we actually see that you're faster when it's between categories than when it's within categories. So they, with the right visual field, you're faster if it's a green among a bunch of blue distractors than if it's that exact same green chip amongst a bunch of green distractors, even though the psychological distance is the same from that target to either the green or the blue distractors. So that's, a, again, a, what, what I call a lateralized wharf effect. I'm seeing that language is influencing these perceptual judgments 
but only in the right visual field and not in the left visual field. So let me just pause for a second and make sure that if I see if there's any questions, I don't really see all of you. So if anyone does have a question at this point, this is a good time to ask because it's really the first basic result and we're gonna spend some time unpacking it. So again, chime in if you have any questions now. Uh, Professor Richard Ivory is asking if anybody has a question. This is a good moment to ask um, a question about what he has talked about thus far. So uh, does anybody wanna either take the microphone or write your questions, please? Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll go on, but again, um, if anything pops up in the chat or anywhere, just 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 break in. Okay, so this was a, a um, you know, a really, I think, uh, um, surprising result to me and, and, and really interesting. And we next, uh, uh, we actually realized, you know, well, you know, these are people who are, their brains are neurologic, are normal. And, you know, we know there's a lot of communication between the left and the right side of the brain, but we actually, there's some rare cases and there aren't very many of these left in the world, but um, in the uh, 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s, uh, when people had severe, severe epilepsy that didn't respond to medication, they would sometimes do a procedure where they would separate the connections between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. This is this corpus callosum right here. So this is this giant bundle of axons that are basically connecting the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And uh, surgically, the surgeons would go in, the neurosurgeons would go in and they would basically cut these fibers. So they aren't destroying any neurons. They're just cutting a particular pathway of connections from one side of the brain to the other, what's called the split brain procedure. Officially it's called the colossotomy, but we all call it the split brain procedure. Clinically, it's amazing. It really treated epilepsy in a tremendous way. You know, you might think of it as perhaps some epileptic activity starts in one hemisphere, but because it can't cross over to the other side, it can't build up. And so these people, you know, amazingly positive impact on their life to have this procedure. And strikingly, uh, they've been well studied uh, over the years, uh, very subtle changes in cognition and perception. If you talk to them, uh, watch them move, anything, you, you wouldn't be able to tell that a person's had one of these colossotomy operations. If you do subtle experiments, you can reveal all sorts of interesting things. Uh, I got interested in the split brain patients because of my interest in bimanual coordination. And I realized, oh, if you don't have the two hemispheres talking to each other, maybe you'll be even better at bimanual coordination. That's what the cartoon's trying to capture. And, you know, we did all sorts of things on the classic, you know, can you pat, rub your stomach and pat your head at the same time? You know, a very fundamental question in psychology. Um, these, these individuals have no trouble doing that. Well, we realized we could test them on the lateralized dwarf effect, because again, in these cases, we know that the information is going to be restricted to one hemisphere. So we only work with, they're very rare patients. So we only actually did the experiment with a couple of people. Um, uh, but nonetheless, you can test them multiple times and you get very robust data from them. So we're going to do the same experiment. They're going to say, is the oddball on the left or on the right? Uh, now we're going to let them use the, you know, let use the left hand if it's on the left, the right hand if it's on the right, just so that everything's sort of lined up. The right hemisphere now has to process the information on the left and use the left hand to respond. The left hemisphere has to process information on the right and use the right hand to respond. We're only gonna flash this for a fifth of a second, 200 milliseconds. So that way we know the guy's not gonna cheat and move his eyes and get the information into both hemispheres. We're not gonna give him the opportunity to do that. And they're very good at maintaining fixation. So we know we can really restrict things to one hemisphere or the other. And here's the results, okay? We get a really nice replication in the colossotomy patient. For the left visual field, again, no difference. And notice he's very good at this task. He's even faster than our college students. This guy's done many, many psychophysical experiments. So he's really good at it. Uh, you know, he may only needing about a third of a second, no difference in terms of the linguistic categories there. So this is a blue among greens. That would be a between category judgment. But if I had a blue amongst the lighter blues, again, that would be the within category, no difference there. 
But in the right visual field, again, showing this advantage when it's between category, faster response we're taking as an advantage, right? They're faster at making that perceptual judgment. And they're faster, again, when it's between category compared to within, with its within category. So that's what I mean, that lateralized dwarf effect again. Now, it's actually a robust effect. We turn not to the world of color, but just to see how general is this effect. We decided to use it with a different linguistic category where we made pictures here. There's two dogs and two cats. We couldn't make it, we tried, but we didn't really, we weren't either successful to actually make the psychological spacing greater, I equal between dog one and dog two and dog two and cat one. I think you'd all agree that these two are more different than these two and these two are more different than these two. So we didn't equate the psychological distance here. So you're always probably gonna be faster on the between category thing because there's a perceptual similarity difference there. But the results here, so we do the exact same experiment. We have a ring of 12 of these pictures and there's one oddball and you simply say, is the oddball on the right or the left? We don't, they don't have to think about cats and dogs. They just say, where's the perceptual difference on the right or left? Again, because I think the between category judgments, that would be this cat among this dog is easier than the cat among a cat. You get a between category effect, whether it's the left visual field or the right visual field. That's affecting, I think that reflecting that psychological distancing. But that difference is larger in the right visual field than in the left visual field. So again, when the information's in the language hemisphere, that left hemisphere, you get an amplification here of that between category difference. So again, we're seeing that lateralized wharf effect over again now, but now not just in the color domain, but it seems to be a general effect. We can see it with other linguistic categories. So let's turn back and take stock here. So what does it mean for this relationship of language, thought, and perception? And we published this work. I think it, it caused a, a pretty big stir. We got a lot of press about it and the paper's been cited quite a bit and folks have followed up. And, and because again, it had been this long, you know, 50 year debate. I'm not saying we're at the final answer here, but at least I think our task addressed many of the concerns that had existed with earlier studies there. Um, because it seems like we have a very simple, basic perceptual task, right? We're not asking about color names or anything like that. We're not asking people to judge the similarity. We're just saying how quickly you can, pick, can you pick up a perceptual difference, uh, inhomogeneity in the display. Um, but still, it's a perceptual task. But I think we still want to remain skeptical about this. This mean that language really shapes the way we perceive. So this is again, um, the cognitive psychologist in me is saying, you know, as cognitive psychologists, we wanna really understand, you know, at what stage of processing is there this interaction between language and perception? We know language affects performance on a perceptual task, but doing a perceptual task, you know, I have to see the things, I have to make a decision, I have to make a response. And so to me, the question could break down that, you know, we know the language is having an effect in the left hemisphere. That's here, the left hemisphere, not in the right hemisphere. Is it because language is really changing the left hemisphere perceptual apparatus? Like for instance, maybe those color names being the language being in the left hemisphere has kind of warped all our perceptual detectors, right? We know there's cells in the uh, uh, visual pathways of the left hemisphere and right hemisphere that are sensitive to colors. So they're, they're, those neurons are what give rise to our experience of color. And it could be having close proximity to say linguistic representations has kind of warped those perceptual detectors in the left hemisphere. That would be a very strong way of thinking about mechanistically how language changes perception. That is the Neurons that are sensitive to green and blue get pushed further apart over our lifetime of experience through the interactions of language in the perceptual system. So that'd be a perceptual account. A post-perceptual account still acknowledges that there's a difference, you know, language is affecting performance on the task, but it would be saying that, well, it's not really perception that's been changed, it's these post-perceptual processes. Okay, so that language isn't really shaping the way we early on stages of often actually perceiving the colors, but it's how we process the information. Now, let me give you one example of that, okay? Uh, um, 
you know, well, first I'll just say the experimental challenge as a, at least to a cognitive psychologist, you know, might seem like a, a subtle distinction, uh, but it's really, you know, how do we then evaluate this perceptual and post-perceptual hypotheses, keeping in mind that they both could be right. But we wanna to try to figure out a way to test this or think about that in a stronger way. So let me just walk through one of these post-perceptual models. And the idea is that if something's in the left visual field and it goes to the right hemisphere, well, we know that the right hemisphere has, is able to perceive colors. So presumably it has these color sensitive neurons. And when we get that input, right, we're gonna get all these different colors that are gonna be activated, right? We're sensitive to that. And again, if we see some difference in those color detectors, we're gonna say that the difference is on the left visual field. Now in the right visual field, the idea is that we also have that same activation of the colors Okay, right, the chips that are one color are activating some set of neurons, the chip that's different is activating a different set of neurons. But in addition, the right visual field might be activating the words associated with each color chip. So when I see a chip, I not only have a perceptual representation of what that color is, but I also activate the word that's associated with it. And notice that if it's a between category thing, if some of the chips are labeled green and one's labeled blue, well, then the left hemisphere is gonna have two different things that's saying there's a difference out there. The perceptual detectors are gonna say there's a difference, but the words are also gonna be telling you, the lexical entities, the words are also gonna tell you that there's a difference. If it's a within category now, though, even though the color detectors will detect there's a difference out there, the exact same word's gonna be activated in response to all the color chips. And so now we have kind of a conflict the perceptual detectors are saying, hey, there's a non-homogeneity out there. There's some difference over here. But the lexical representations, the words are going to be saying, nope, they're all blues. They're all green or they're all greens. And there's a famous thing in psychology called the Stroop effect, right? That's where you try to read what this word says. And that word says green, but it's printed in red. And we all experience that conflict. We want to say that that's red, okay? Uh, um, because that color, we can't really help but process the color or the word, I should say. We can't help but process the word. So actually, the real Stroop effect is when I try to name the color. I try to say, oh, that's, that's red color there. But I get stuck. I want to say it's green because, you know, if you're a, 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 a um, had education, you know, reading is sort of an automatic thing. You can't help it. And so we see there's a, a conflict there and there's an RT cost. We're slower to respond but we don't necessarily say that the word there changes the redness of that image. It's the fact that we have two independent codes that are in conflict. So how are we gonna test this? So we're gonna use a number of different ways to try to test this. And one idea is that let's look about at people who have compromised language abilities, okay? If we don't have language, then presumably we'll have a depression, you know, we probably aren't going to wipe out all of language. I mean, that might be our dream subject, but we're still going to take people who have some difficulty with language. And we're going to see, does that modulate the size of this lateralized wharf effect? And we're going to ask, you know, we're going to run our experiment. We're going to run it with this population. We're going to ask, does that lateralized wharf effect I've described, is it abolished? Now, if the effect persists, that's going to favor the long-term changes in perceptual detectors. Okay, we're going to say that, look, even without language still being present, um, you still get this change, presumably because the person had language abilities, uh, they had that long-term warping. If the effect is abolished, then we're going to say that that really would be evidence in favor of this post-perceptual model. When you eliminate that irrelevant information, that conflicting information, then the effect would be gone, we expect to be gone. So that's the experiment. In this first case, we're gonna study patients who have aphasia from having left hemisphere strokes. And again, no stroke, right? Strokes are random events and so forth. And language is a really robust function. So, you know, these individuals don't lose all their language abilities, but nonetheless, their language is severely compromised in the people. Some of them have trouble with understanding language. Some of them have trouble producing. Most of them have some problem on both comprehension and language. So these are just individuals with aphasia. And we're gonna then take people who haven't had strokes, so neurologically healthy, but they're gonna be matched for age and education. 
And we're gonna run the experiment I just described. And here are the results. So first of all, because they have a left hemisphere stroke, many of them can't use the right hand. So everyone had to use their left hand to respond. The stroke patients did. So we made the control subjects use their left hand too. And just as the controls and showing a replication of that lateralized wharf effect I showed you before, no difference in the left visual field, an advantage for the between subject in the right visual field. Okay, now here's the stroke data. And it's really quite surprising. So the first thing and the main thing we were interested in is do they show this between advantage for the right visual field? Because now the information is going to that damaged hemisphere. They're slower because it's in the weaker hemisphere, but nonetheless, that wharf effect has been abolished. So you compromise, you take someone who's got compromised language abilities and they no longer show that advantage of the between category effect versus the within. All right. Um, surprisingly and totally unexpected is that they actually show a little bit of a reverse uh, wharf effect, okay? That's this reversal. Notice that they're now actually faster, and this is a significant difference, even though pretty noisy data, but this is a significant difference. Now these individuals are faster in the left visual field for the between category than in the within category. Totally unexpected result on our part. We were really only interested to see if this lateralized wharf effect you see in the controls would replicate in the patients, and it doesn't. So that argues against the perceptual account. This is a real puzzle. Why do they actually show this reversal? All right, so now we're gonna take a second test of this, okay? All right, now we're actually gonna take healthy individuals, okay? But, so they have language abilities, but we're gonna actually tax their language function, okay? And we're gonna ask, does this also attenuate that wharf effect? And again, it's the same predictions. If it doesn't, then it's going to favor the perceptual model. If it does, if it's a transient effect, we're going to assume it's post-perceptual. Because if it was a perceptual change, a transient manipulation in an experiment shouldn't have any effect on those perceptual detectors. And the way we tax language is that we make the people do the task that we told you about before. They're gonna see this ring of colors. One of them's gonna be an oddball. Again, it's not shown here in color, but it's the same thing, the green and blue chips and so forth. Simultaneously, while they're doing this task, they're actually gonna be seeing word names. And later on, they're gonna be given a memory list, okay? And they're gonna to have to say, you know, uh, was that word present or not? Or, or recall the list of color names. So we're not only taxing their verbal processes because we're giving them a, they have to do two things at the same time. They have to do the basic visual search task, but they also have to do this verbal interference task. And the idea is if language resources are consumed by the second task, will that impact their performance on the primary task? This is a classic method in cognitive psychology to look for what we call dual task, meaning multitask interference. So here's the no interference. That's just basically a replication of our... Okay, uh, I didn't know if I was unmuted or, uh, um, or, or questioned. So here's the, the uh, basically this is again showing that we replicate our basic effect in this study because we have some trials, some where there's no interference. And you can see there's that lateralized wharf effect, no difference in the left visual field, robust difference in the right visual field. Now we do that verbal interference and we completely wipe out the wharf effect. And in fact, it tends to reverse here. Okay, so again, two things stand out. A second way that we can now get rid of the lateralized wharf effect, this time in healthy individuals by just making them do a secondary language task. And that puzzle I mentioned earlier that you actually see not only the effects lost, but you see a reversal similar to what we had seen with the aphasic patients. I'll tell you about a third example. This isn't from uh, our work I was involved in. This is from some others, but they look to see, do you get this lateralized wharf effect in infants? So they're actually gonna look at four to six month old infants who don't have language presumably yet. And they're basically asking, you know, do you see a difference between the right visual field and the left visual field on this perceptual discrimination? 
Now they can't do the fancy task we do of, you know, say which side, you know, the oddballs on, that's a little too challenging for a five month old infant, but infants like to look at things, okay? So basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna present an oddball and it's gonna be either on the right or on the left. And it's either gonna be, here's a case of a blue target. It's not an oddball, it's just a stimulus. That stimulus is on the right side against a background that's a different color name. So this is blue on the green, but they'll have other trials where it's a blue chip on a bluish background. So in one case, again, it's from the same color and the other case, it's from the different color, et cetera. They can do the whole thing we did. Again, of course, the kids don't, infants don't have the lexical categories, but they wanna see, you know, is this sort of heart wired into, is there, are there perceptual differences in our color detectors? Uh, when they do this with the adults, uh, again, it's hard to see here, but they do get a bigger difference when it's between category than when it's within category. So again, it's a different task, but it's showing that lateralized wharf effect again, because that category effect is stronger in the right visual field. The key data was the babies and the babies don't show that effect again. So we're seeing effect of language mediating perception in the right visual field for adults, but that's absent in the babies. And <laughs> once again, we see a reversal. Now we actually see this effect in the left visual field in the babies. All right, so let's take stock of this first part of the talk, okay? So I tried to compare, say, we know that language influences performance on these uh, tasks, okay? So there's clearly an effect of language on performance on a perceptual task. And it's a very basic perceptual task. There's no language involved. So again, it cleans up a lot of the problems with other studies. But I outlined sort of two different ways to think about that effect. One notion favored this idea about a truly perceptual thing that language has sort of changed our color detector system versus I wanted to contrast that with a post-perceptual model. And I think the results I've shown you so far, the fact that you can lose the effect in aphasic patients, perhaps even most impressive that you can lose it just by having people do a secondary linguistic task um, you know, the fact that it's such a transient effect, it can be momentarily reversed, I think, argues against any sort of perceptual warping that you might think about in that perceptual model I put forward. And so I'd say that these results are actually favoring this post-perceptual account more than the perceptual account. But we have seen now three examples of this reversal, this totally unexpected reversal that now you actually seem to get a between category difference in the left visual field than in the right visual field. It's reliable in the patients. And when we first saw that result, we thought, well, maybe the brain's been reorganized. Maybe language has sort of migrated or certain aspects of language function have migrated over to the right hemisphere. And that's why you see it in the patients. But that doesn't really work for the infants and it doesn't really work for the controls. You know, any sort of sort of compensation or migration idea. Couldn't explain it in the infants because presumably they don't have language functions operating at all. And certainly, you know, it's not a reliable reversal in the controls, but it's a trend there. And you wouldn't expect that there's any reorganization when I do this task uh, in the control subjects. So I'll just give a hypothesis about why you get the reversals. And um, again, it goes back to some classic cross-cultural work on color perception. And I mentioned that, you know, kind of a universal, or one thing that differs from one language to another is the number of color, basic color terms they have. So in English we have, it depends how you count, whether you count purple, but you could say as shown here or, or pink, we have six, seven or eight basic color terms in English. And that's what's shown here. You add in white and black, maybe you take out pink and purple and you have about eight different colors. Okay, uh, in other languages, as I mentioned, they have more color names in some languages, basic color names in other languages, they have fewer. And again, as I said, some languages only have three basic color terms, you know, red, white, and black. And everything else is sort of a variant on that. Like, you know, the way we say light blue uh, in, in these languages for something like blue, they might say it's sort of somewhere between, uh, it's a uh, off red or something like that. Um, so there's these linguistic differences in how you carve up color space. But within every language, where you actually think the focal color is, if I ask you, where's the best red? 
or where's the best yellow, where's the best blue, okay? You're gonna, it doesn't matter whether you have another color term for green or blue, you're actually gonna put your focal color near the same location. So there's quite a bit of similarity across different cultures in terms of where they see these focal colors, all right? So that's sort of something that's been observed that there's something kind of wired into our brains about what we call the best red, what's the typical one. And the hypothesis we put forward is that the color detectors in the right hemisphere, not their left hemisphere, in the right hemisphere are better tuned. That means that they may have sharper tuning than those in the left hemisphere in terms of these universal color categories. So it might be, again, you know, we have color sensitive neurons in the right hemisphere, color sensitive neurons in the left hemisphere, but the shape of those neurons might be slightly different where we have sharper tuning in the right visual field than in the left visual field. That's the hypothesis here. And that account would work with the infants. It would basically say that the babies have an innate bias where they're gonna be better at picking up between focal category differences in the right visual field, I mean, in the left visual field, in the right hemisphere, than in the right visual field or in the left hemisphere because of the better tuning of the color detector system in the right hemisphere, okay? And that might be, again, something that's innately biased or it could be early maturation. You know, we're only testing four or five months old. They've been living for a little while, but we know there's a lot of asymmetries in the brain between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. You might think that's weird, you know, why should my left and right brain perceive the world differently? My argument is that that's sort of an evolutionary advantage, that each side of the brain is taking a slightly different snapshot of the world. Usually the results of those two snapshots kind of converge on the same answer, but it's actually better to get two different pictures of the world than to get one different picture. Um, uh, the same thing happens in sound that we see differences that, again, the two ears or the way they project information to the two hemispheres, that auditory information isn't identical in how it's processed by the two hemispheres. It's giving you slightly different pictures, which are going to, and those slightly different pictures are going to be useful for different types of perceptual judgments. So the idea is that there's this asymmetrical perceptual tuning it gets distorted when we have a language task in there in healthy individuals because we see those color chips and we activate this additional representation, the lexical representation. So we have both the perceptual representation and the lexical, the language representation. And the two of them get mixed together when we're making those judgments on our lateralized dwarf task. But if we take away language, either by that secondary task manipulation, the dual task one, or in the people with aphasia by their brain injury, now we once again reveal that there's this asymmetrical perceptual tuning out there. And that's why we get the reversals. So that's a, a post hoc, after the fact sort of hypothesis that might account for why we see the lateralized dwarf effect consistently in you know, healthy individuals, but why it disappears and not only disappears, but reverses when we actually uh, do something that impacts your language processing abilities. Now, there's tests that we can do on this and we still need to do them. Because again, as I said, that's sort of a post hoc hypothesis, uh, but you really wanna use a hypothesis to generate new experiments, to have a strong test. We don't wanna sit in the armchair and just sort of speculate. We gotta put our hypotheses to experimental you know, evaluation. Uh, this hypothesis would predict that if we do the secondary task thing, you know, again, the unmasking is really about color tuning. So if I do the secondary task manipulation, that language manipulation, I should take away that right visual field between versus within category difference. I should get rid of the lateralized dwarf effect, but I shouldn't get the I shouldn't get any reversal because there's no reason to expect any reversal related to you know asymmetric color tuning. So that's one prediction. Uh, and this one we have actually done. So this is showing here with no interference, that's that lateralized dwarf effect I showed you before, stronger in the right visual field than the left no interference. With verbal interference, I wipe out the effect, but uh, um, I don't produce any sort of reversal. So that actually is consistent with this idea the stronger test or the other test would be that if we take the aphasia patients, aphasic patients again, and we test them on the cat-dog task, 
they should lose the lateralized dwarf effect, but they should lose the cat dog effect there. And, and that, that hypothesis we haven't tested yet. And the stronger one would be actually to actually look at, use some very basic perceptual uh, sensitivity tasks and basically look to see, is there a difference in terms of color discrimination for information, you know, get rid of the language entirely, just do a straightforward psychophysics perceptual analysis of how sensitive is our color detectors in the left visual field versus the right visual field. That would be the direct test of the asymmetric tuning hypothesis. And uh, um, we predict that there should be sharper boundaries in the left visual field around these focal colors. People have done that. People do really good visual psychophysics. And I can't say that the evidence is that supportive. I mean, there's papers here that have claimed some support for that idea, but it's very inconsistent. And so I think the best picture to date is to say that that isn't really well supported in the you know strict perceptual assassins there. All right, I'm gonna um, even stop sharing for one second here so you can see me, because that really wraps up the first part of the talk, okay? And I'm gonna take a sip of uh, my tea here, uh, wet my mouth and give you a chance to digest things and um, you know, address any questions you might have on that first part, because that really covers the first part of the, of the lecture. I have a second part about face perception. We can get to that uh, if you want, uh, another way to look at the interaction of language perception, but this is a good time to, to take stock. Great, thank you, Professor Ivory. Uh, I think we already have two questions. So uh, pro pro it could be probably a good idea if you can take a look at the chat, um, just in case I don't pronounce everything correctly. Sure, okay. So um, um, let me just start up at the top. Um, yes, hello from Mexico City. I've been there once, that was amazing. It was like a few months before the pandemic settled in and I had a, uh, a few days to wander around the amazing city. Um, all right, um, nice dogs, excellent, good. Um, let's get to the questions here. Um, okay, so asking, I think about, are there cases in which such a procedure couldn't be performed? And uh, that procedure could refer to um, running our lateralized dwarf task, but I'm gonna guess that it's actually more about the neurological procedure about doing the corpus callosotomy operation. And Ana Luisa, you can tell me if that's correct or not, but I assume that uh, it's really about the surgical intervention. And um, it's a, a tragedy for research. It's a benefit for the patients, I suppose. Um, uh, that procedure was never, all that common, um, maybe, you know, I think less than a hundred people have undergone the colossotomy procedure over the years. Um, amazing success record. So they don't do it not because it's not successful, but you know, it is a neurosurgical intervention. So that's always got risk associated with it. It's a pretty radical procedure. So if people have epilepsy, of course, what they do at first is they give drug treatment. And there's a lot of different drugs out there to treat epilepsy. And in most cases, the drugs can manage the, dis the disorder quite well. So you're only a candidate for a surgical intervention uh, um, if you're not responsive to the medication and you suffer from very severe seizure disorder. You know, the kind of seizure disorder where you're having 15 or 20 grand mal seizures every day, and you're basically kind of in a post-ictal, post-recovery state almost all the time, where it really impacts your, 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 your life, okay? Um, but over the years, what the surger, surgical intervention has changed from, right, with a split brain procedure, you're saying there's a certain part of the brain that generates seizure activity, and then it spreads across the brain and you get giant oscillations. So the seizures just keep sweeping across the brain. But we know that that seizure originates in a fairly focal part of the brain. And so the transition in surgical interventions has been to actually try to find where is the locus of the seizure activity and just cut out that tissue. So they still do neurosurgery as treatment for intractable epilepsy or epilepsy that is non-responsive to medication. But the surgical procedure now is actually to record from the brain either superficially or in some cases now they actually implant electrodes directly on the cortex 
identify exactly where the tissue is that's generating the abnormal seizure activity. And that tissue tends to be not functional in the normal sense because it's been taken over by kind of whatever causes the seizures and just cut out that small piece of tissue. So that starting around 2000, that started even earlier, really 1985, that method started coming into play and now it's basically taken over. So in the 1980s, still some people got a colostomy procedure into the 1990s, a few of them, but gradually over time, this other procedure, the lobectomy they call it, has basically taken over and, and that's the surgical intervention of choice. And it's very rare that anyone would do a colostomy operation. So people like me, you know, we've been wiped out because this is such a, an amazing resource to be able to study these people who don't have the two hemispheres talking to each other. Wonderful things have been discovered. Roger Sperry got a Nobel Prize for his work on that, but uh, um, really not, there aren't individuals like that anymore. There are people who are born without a corpus callosum, um, but again, they've had that difference from birth and uh, remember the corpus callosum is connected to the two halves of the brain. These individuals tend to have a lot of different neurological problems along the midline of the brain and actually midline of the body. So something happens during development that affects the whole midline axis. And so they tend to have pretty severe, uh, many of them have um, a multitude of cognitive problems. Uh, some of them don't and, and we study them, but people who were born without a corpus callosum, their behavior is quite different from people who had that surgical intervention who had the two Fs communicating and then it was resected. All right, the next question. Um, By the way, he repeated uh, yeah. the same shit. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, that's right. So it, it's it, it's it's a a, a, a two way street here. So um, the second part. So the question is really about uh, um, you know I've been talking about how language affects perception, uh, but the, um, Alberto's correctly pointing out that uh, um, there's also quite a bit of work asking about how perception shapes, shapes the lexalization of color terms in several languages and uh, uh, spot on uh, uh, observation, right? And, and the question was really, you know, how do we you know, think about this bidirectionality and so forth? And um, I actually think that the majority of the work has gone in that reverse direction. Okay, when I talk about, about how our conceptual knowledge is influenced by language, okay, or how our memory is influenced by our language, those are examples of that. So again, when I talk about, you know, that the indigenous people of the Arctic have uh, many different words for color terms, okay, again, there's a case uh, uh, where we're really seeing about uh, um, they perceive the world, but because these things are important, right, they have to look at the snow and decide, is this the kind of snow that's good for for, for a, a, a sledding over, or is this kind of, you know, snow that my sled's going to get stuck in, okay, and they have a term, right, they, they have a term for snow that you can sled on, and a different term for snow that you can't sled on, there's a case where their ability to perceive that difference between these two types of snow it's important for them that they've lexicalized things. They've actually come up with one word for the good sliding snow and a different word for the bad sliding snow, okay? Uh, so that's a case of, again, the perception being important to them has led them to lexicalize something. Not important for us Californians, you know, snow is snow, okay? We can talk about it that way. Uh, um, you, it's not a, perce a, a, a perceptual example, but the one I gave about Spanish, you know, leaving out the agent in many sentences is another case, right? Where there it's not so much maybe the perceptual difference. Uh, um, there it's a case of, of the language difference really affecting the memory. But again, that's sort of these conceptual effects. So my answer would be that much of this research has really been about how perceptual differences can influence language, language, this whole interaction at the conceptual level. And the work I was doing with Paul, I mean, Paul, it's always been gnawing at him, okay? Is there also this influence of language on perception? What the strong version of the Whorf hypothesis? And that, you know, sort of, I think what he set out to tackle when he did his classic studies on, on, on uh, uh, color naming, which is how he got into the whole world about the universes of color naming. And, you know, I think, 
he thought he had sort of an answer. Skeptics came along, you know, after, you know, Stalinist in the 80s. And then he kind of saw this opportunity, or we, we, you know, together with Terry Regeer, this notion about, look, here's another way we can get at it that gets down to a more fundamental perceptual task. But as soon as we did that, we started thinking, well, even though it's a perceptual task, it still might have these post-perceptual accounts. And, and, you know, I'm arguing that the evidence actually favors more of a post-perceptual account rather than a perceptual account. If you talk to Paul Kay or you talk to Terry Regeer, they actually, I think, would argue less strongly that way. I think they believe that there is some perceptual effects too. Um, collateral effects about the colostomy procedure. I'll just uh, uh, briefly say, because um, uh, I've had, I've been fortunate to work with maybe five or six of these individuals who have had the colostomy procedure, and the most striking thing to me is that if you talk with them. Uh, hang out with them, you would not know that they've had this procedure. You got to do things like, you know, put them in front of a computer screen and present things very quickly because they're very good at like moving their head and getting the information into both hemispheres very quickly. So uh, um, they can really overcome, even though the information segregated, they, they, they get it to both hemispheres very quickly or they can, you know, or you can basically do lots of things with just one hemisphere providing the information. Now, if you hang out with them long enough, then you can start to see some really fascinating behavior. Like one of my favorites was um, I was talking to one, a woman who'd had a colostomy procedure and we were just chit-chatting between experiments, you know, and I asked her what she was reading and she reached out with her left hand and picked up a book and handed it to me and then looked at it and said, no, that's not what I'm reading. So both halves of the brain kind of comprehended my question. You know, what are you, what are you reading? The right hemisphere kind of knew the general question because the right hemisphere, I can understand, I think, basic language in some way. So it kind of knew what I was asking about, but her left hand didn't know the exact book. It can't read, the right hemisphere can't read. So it chose the wrong book. Okay, and, and she actually, you know, then told me that, you know, she gets problems like this all the time. She'll go to her freezer. She's thinking, I want to go out and take out that frozen uh, uh, dinner. I'm going to cook that, the, the, you know, the frozen meatballs or something for dinner. Um, but she'll open her freezer because the way the freezer opens with her right hand and her left hand will reach in and grab out the, the dessert, the frozen dessert. Okay, so again, she's consciously thinking, and I think this is what I mean by consciousness, you know, consciousness is probably tied up with our linguistic system in some sense, or our phenomenal experiences is more about the language. Mike Kazanigo will talk about the left hemisphere of the interpreter. I might favor more of the, the language system there. She's got the thought, I need something out of the refrigerator. I want it to be the, uh, the entree, but her right hand's occupied by the door and so her left hand has to do the reaching and it doesn't know exactly what it is she wants to take out of the freezer and she she's really humorous she talks about how she has to arrange her freezer in a certain way to overcome that problem because it's a consistent problem and she doesn't want to take the time to open the door put her hand down and reach in with the right hand yeah um i have about three or four questions i don't know if i could ask you um, my first question, which is more of a sort of observation, but probably a question, is uh, these experiments where you have these colors um, and you do experiments or carry out experiments and you find that certain colors are more perceptually salient. Uh, is there any chance that what is going on there is that those so-called um, focal colors just so happen to be the colors that are more regularly present in the environment. And so, yeah. Are, yeah. And, yeah. and so, so one, um, I'm not an expert yeah. on this topic, uh, but it's, um, it's actually, it's a well-studied problem. Paul Kay has been, and Terry Regeer, uh, my colleagues have worked on it quite a bit, but, but many, many people have, and there's, there's quite a few theories about why some things are focal colors. So we know that for instance, in our eyes, we have three primary receptors that are give us our sensitivity to color, right? In the so-called cones in the eye, they're sensitive to the variation in wavelengths that are associated with the reflection of color that give rise to the impression of color. 
That information is combined by the color sensitive neurons in the brain. So we can talk about three cones in the eye, but they get mapped onto kind of the red, green, and the yellow, blue channels. And that's what gives rise to our experience there. And the question is, you know, why do you have these universals in the color mapping? And there's, you know, uh, uh, hypotheses that go with things like, for instance, if you look at the sensitivity, either of the receptors in the eye or of the way they're combined in the brain, that again, a focal color might be where you get the sharpest difference in the response a, between the three different receptors or their accumulated response. There's other theories that talk about that, you know, it's actually the, uh, also something about the optics of the eye, eye that are causing stronger activation for certain parts of the spectrum there. So uh, there's lots of people have kind of looked at this in terms of, you know, basic like physiological explanations there. There's others who have also talked about it in terms of experiential factors. And so they try to say, look, we know how these focal colors exist, but there's slight distortions and might that have to do with, you know, the kinds of colors you experience. So if you're in a rich tropical environment, has that also like say distorted uh, uh, greens or if you're, you know, in the desert of Baja, right? And you don't see many greens, you know, does that change your color? So you can find theories about each of these out there in the literature. I can't give you a synthesis of where does the field stand, you know, circa 2021 on that on that question. Yeah, you want to bring in a, a color expert. I, I'm only, I'm aware of sort of the debates and I, I don't know where the evidence really lies right at the moment. Yeah, uh, we have a question from teacher Mary Kristen. Uh, do you think that the language we speak can shape our way of perceiving the world, but could the influence be so strong as in the book 1984 from George Orwell? Yeah, um, I do. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I, I um, me too, as a matter of fact, me too. I, I also do think so, yes. Yeah, yeah it's, um, okay, so again, um, uh, since we're talking about language and words, let's be careful with our language and words. And so when you think that, do you think that the language you speak can shape our way of perceiving the world? Uh, how do you, could you define perceiving for me, please? Well, perceiving, um, in a basic in a basic term like uh, um, uh, you know regular people the way regular people uh, sees the world let's say I'm not uh, going to I'm not trying to to use a, 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 a what a complicated word in a general way that people sees the world that is perceiving the world okay. okay. All right, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I was a trick question, okay? Um, because, um, you know, we're visual creatures and we use our language in this metaphorical way and many of our metaphors are visually based. And I think when you say perceiving the world, I don't think you mean, you know, with our eyes looking out there and I'm looking out now and I'm seeing, you know, the house across the street and the bay. No, no, no. I think you're thinking yeah. about, you know, worldview, so really, and in a technical sense, I, I'd say we have to change the word from shape the way we conceive the world. Okay. Perceive the world. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, that, that, and that, you know, in a nutshell is actually kind of what this talk was largely about. I think everyone would agree that language shapes the way we conceive the world. But we use language in a loose way that we sometimes substitute the word perceive for conceive. Okay. And in my program there with, with Paul and, and, and Paul Kay was basically, okay, we talk about Warfian, talked about language changes the way we perceive the world. Does he really mean perceive the world or does he mean how we conceive the world? So I think we'd agree that language changes the way we conceive the world. And our question was narrower. Does it actually go all the way back to the earliest building blocks of how we take in information? Does it change our perception? And, uh, and that's what the, the studies I've talked about were. But now if we step back and ask your question, because it's the more important question, you know, about language and perception, conception, because that's really, we care about the, the influence of language and thought. And um, I think, you know, Lots of, you know, it's, it can be boring experiments like, you know, uh, language changing the way we think about who spilled the wine. I gave that example early on. That's a pretty innocuous thing, you know, that, you know, in Spanish, I'm not as clumsy a person maybe as I am uh, to English speakers. But 
uh, you're thinking, you know, more dramatically, like when it really starts to have an impact on things. And, and I think, um, you know, uh, to me, all the things we hear about the conspiracy theories, you know, about QAnon and all that, that is examples of language. I mean, certainly videos, doctored videos play a role here, but I think uh, um, we're seeing striking examples in, in politics about people recognizing that language can have a huge impact on how we conceptualize things. And if you say the same thing over and over again, that there, there's two things there. One is say it, uh, because language will change how you conceive it. And it's also taking advantage of the fact that, you know, our memory systems aren't that great. We can't tell the difference between something we experienced and something we heard about. They very quickly get blended together. So if you say the same thing over and over again, yes. it's really going to have an impact on how you conceive the world. And so I keep hearing that, you know, vaccines, oh, didn't you hear the vaccines killed three people and so, so or caused blood clots and, you know, three individuals, something like that. Eventually, you know, that changes the way we conceive the world and um, very, very quickly. I mean, of course, if you're bombarded with this information, it has a huge impact on how you conceive the world. But if you only... A bit so um you know yes uh, and the same way uh you know i am i i teach in high school as we uh, most of the teachers here we teach in high school and and uh they are bombarding our students with uh with uh different uh theories that are uh crazy like that the the earth is flat and things like that but they repeat them so so frequently and and so many times that some students start to believe that. Okay. So things that are said so many times, they, they start to become true. Well, and, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, do the thought experiment. Suppose you watched a, a television station and um, you know every uh, week or two, they did a story on the new evidence about the world being flat. And if you only took their information from that one TV station, uh, you know, it's not like you're a bad thinker or anything like that. That's the only information you have, right? So um, we always say that we want to build, you know, it's much more important to build the critical thinking skills than to build, than to give a lot of content, right? Yes, and, I agree. I agree. Teacher, um, but it's, it's, you know, awfully hard. It's much easier at a university level to kind of focus on critical thinking skills. And I, I'm pretty sure that students who take my cognitive neuroscience class probably forget most of the details within a year. But I think uh, we give assignments that really push critical thinking skills that I bet that has some lasting impact. But, you know, I think it's probably even harder at the high school level to focus on, you know, critical thinking skills rather than content because, you, you know, you guys get you know, you have a lot of demands on you that you have to cover this content. You got to get through this aspect of geometry or something. And so, you, you know, you're, you're forced almost in some cases by the demands of the curriculum to focus more on content than critical thinking skills. And so it's a okay. real challenge. Well, that's a good advice. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have, we have much more luxury at the university level to, uh, to shape it in terms of let's put the emphasis on the critical thinking, I think. I mean, I'm sure it happens at all levels of teaching and, and so forth, but, but I can also appreciate how it's more constrained at the high school level. We have another um, question from Alejandra Siria. Uh, I was thinking about the effects of action on perception and a possibility of an interaction with language. Specifically, I was thinking about the Simon effect. For example, if participants are instructed to press the left hand key in response to the green target stimulus and the right hand key in response to the blue target stimulus, do you think that the lateralization effects of language on perception could be attenuated or enhanced by, in a, if a congruent action is involved? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so we got a hardcore card carrying cognitive psychologist in the audience. Um, anyone who uses the term Simon effect has to, has to uh, be one of those. That's a, an entryway there. So I welcome you there. Um, so uh, just to repeat the Simon effect, um, the Simon effect would be like, let's say I'm doing a task where I have two keys and I'm gonna press the one on the right whenever I see a blue chip in the screen and the one on the left whenever I see a green. And that's all that's gonna be on the screen. It's a white screen and every now and then a blue chip appears. I press the right key 
and sometimes a, a, a green chip appears, I press the left key. So I just doing this two choice reaction time task, okay? But now sometimes the chip appears on the right, sometimes it appears to the left, but that's irrelevant because my job is just to say what the color is. What you're gonna find is that um, if the right key is pressing for green, I'm faster when the green is on the right than when the green is on the left. And vice versa, if the left hand is for blue, I'm faster responding to blue when it appears on the left than when it appears on the right. So space was irrelevant, but it influences my performance time. That's what the Simon effect is named for some guy named Simon. All right. Um, I think it's exactly the way I think about our lateralized group effects, okay? And it's a little depressing to another cognitive psychologist because uh, it sounded like a really jazzy result when we first had it to say language is changing perception. But when I think about it as really just a glorified Simon effect, it's basically another example about irrelevant information influencing performance, right? That's the hypothesis. If you unpack what I said, I'm saying when things are in the right visual field, they automatically activate the color codes. The colors are irrelevant to the task. We don't, you don't have to say, is it an odd red, blue or green out there? You just have to say, where is the perceptual inhomogeneity? So the color names are irrelevant to the task in the same way in the Simon effect, space is irrelevant. But the human brain is so efficient that it extracts all that information automatically Okay, so I'm extracting, you know, even though I'm trying to say, is there a odd perceptual, a perceptual anomaly on the right side, my brain's so efficient that it's extracting the names for all those colored chips. It's saying blue, 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 green, blue, blue, blue. Okay, it's irrelevant there, but that information's automatically activated because I have such an efficient brain. And once that information gets activated, I can't help but use it. So in the right hemisphere, if those, if I'm hearing two different color names being shouted, that's a cue to me that, hey, there's a difference over there and it speeds up my reaction time. If the language codes are saying, hey, everything's green out there, everything's green out there, but my perceptual system has noted the difference, well, now those word names are irrelevant. They're, they're actually interfering because they're telling me to say everything's the same on the right side. The word codes say everything's the same, but the perceptual system says, no, there's a difference. So now I have a cost in my reaction time because I get a conflict between those automatically activated but irrelevant color cues and what the perceptual system's telling me. So yes, in a sense, I could have phrased it as, you know, our, our post-perceptual account as a, an example of a Simon-like effect. I chose to describe it as a Stroop-like effect, but I see those both as the same thing. It's basically showing the efficiency of the brain but in a particular way now, my experiment makes it that that efficiency of the brain can either be a cost or a benefit, depending on what that irrelevant information is doing. Is it actually, you know, even though it's irrelevant, is it still favoring the correct response or is it favoring the other response? Thank you, Professor Ivory. Um, so I have two more questions, um, if that's okay. Uh, one is quite similar to what uh, Alejandra Siria was asking, I think, I'm not so sure. I was thinking about cognitive load, which is, I guess, a term they use more often in psychology, but I would also like to think about it in terms of neurological load. So do you think that could explain uh, the reversal that you observed in your experiments and that is probably a sort of deloading, there is a sort of deloading or unloading or something, less ne neurological heaviness or something which is causing the system to react either faster or slower to certain um, conditions? Yeah. Um, so um, the, lo the load is important to think about. Um, uh, it's especially important if you're doing something, uh, say, between the tomorrow and the uh, English speakers, because, um, you know, uh, just sitting in front of a computer screen might be very taxing to someone who has, doesn't have experience with it compared to someone who does, okay? So that's always, you know, especially a problem when I'm doing like a between subject sort of experiment, excuse me. So one of the advantages and one of the appeals for, I, you know, why I liked our approach was that by doing a within subject experiment, 
Uh, presumably, the load is quite similar. The general cognitive load is at least constant for that person in some sense. But we do basically our dual task study where we do the concurrent, you know, uh, language task and the visual search. So our basic task is that visual search, but we're seeing how it's influenced by the language task is a cognitive load manipulation. So we're actually doing exactly what you said, but we, we're thinking of it differently and maybe we shouldn't. We're thinking about that it's adding load because it's a secondary task. So we're adding to the load, um, but we're not adding to a general load. I mean, we are adding to a general load, but we're adding a load in terms of a language load. And so the idea is that that's going to really disrupt the language processing system. So that automatic activation of the color names is probably going to be weaker than if we didn't have the secondary language task. So that's why we said, you know, maybe we'll get a selective effect on what's happening in the left hemisphere, or at least that secondary task is going to have a general cognitive load that might affect everything, but also a specific load on the language system. And so in a sense, we can take the language part out and see what the perceptual difference is. What I didn't talk about, um, but we do the same experiment, but we use a non-linguistic non secondary task. Okay, we had a memory test, but you saw these fractal, these abstract images, et cetera, or, or grids of squares. And so again, we tried to make a similar task, but now it was with non-linguistic material. And that was sort of to get at the general effect. And there we continue to see the lateralized wharf effect, but we also see some general slowing. So that was, I didn't show that condition, but we do do a control condition where we use a secondary test that's gonna affect cognitive load, but not in a specific way, not affect the linguistic one. And, and that, that actually did work out quite nicely about impacting performance, but not, not having no, not changing the, the language-based effect. Yeah. I have a third and probably last question, which is the one million uh, question. <laughs> um, I've heard this both from you and other researchers, the, um, the issue of the relationship of language and consciousness. In one of my emails, I even mentioned that. Um, I was wondering, uh, what is your current position about it? Because I heard you say, uh, talk about this um, on your course from about eight or nine years ago, but I don't know if after eight or nine years or so, you still think there is a strong uh, relationship between language and and consciousness. Um, do you think you could? You're putting me down here and you're also showing my uh, um, uh, bad scholarship. Okay, so... Um, uh, so um, Yes, uh, so I've made, uh, so I don't, I'm not a philosopher, okay? I, I'm uh, kind of a, a lab guy. Um, and, um, but, you know, we all, of course, think about consciousness and puzzle about it. And, um, and uh, uh, my naive, so this is really, you know, nothing coming out of research. Um, and I always said, I want to take a sabbatical and focus only on consciousness and, and spend a few years on that problem. But I haven't gotten around to it because I've had too much fun uh, following um, new directions in the lab on sensory motor learning and stuff. But I still got to get to it. So I haven't advanced in my thinking much over the last eight years. So, uh, um, and uh, uh, the position I've, I've taken, and I, I just haven't seen, I've, I've, I try it out on, on people who are more versed and I don't really make much of an impression on them, but I still don't hear the counter argument. So I, I, my claim has been that, uh, that the strong version of the claim is that language and consciousness are basically two words referring to the same thing. Okay, and that claim, um, uh, uh, for me is, is more taken from my phenomenal experience. In defense of that, phenomenal experience, you know, my, my personal introspection. In defense of that, I think uh, consciousness is very much about your subjective experience. So if I stop and think about my conscious experience, okay, right? I know lots is happening in the world. I know much of my mental life is happening outside awareness, but the things that I'm aware of to me seem to be the things I can tell you about. 
right? Consciousness is really, I think, important for sharing minds with another person. And we share our minds, you know, primarily through language or things we can describe with language. And so, you know, at least if I think about that little voice in my head that's conscious, it seems to be, you know, for me talking in English there, it seems to be indistinguishable to me from, uh, from language. Now, again, I, um, you know, people give me all sorts of good counter examples and, and I'll, I'll try them on this audience and some folks can maybe set me straight. Um, uh, take the example about people who say, oh, come on, much of your conscious experience, uh, um, uh, you know, is like, you know, vivid images and so forth and uh, colors, or if I'm a mathematician, you know, equations and geometric, uh, uh, um, geometric entities and so forth. Um, you know, again, that could be reflecting kind of the um, shallowness in the way I think, uh, but I, I don't have that sort of, con I, I certainly have, you know, had things like that. Um, uh, or, or people talk about, you know, uh, um, altered states of consciousness, like uh, uh, psychedelic experiences and so forth. Um, my response there is that um, it's almost to me uh, an oxymoron to say it's an altered state of consciousness. It means you're saying that that experience is different from standard consciousness. So why, it seems wrong to argue that an altered state of consciousness is proof and standard consciousness is something else. If I've already had to tell you it's an altered state of consciousness. So I've never really bought that one. I've actually thought that the fact that people will wake up from a dream and say, oh, I had this great dream and they go to tell you about it and they give you gibberish. It's because whatever their experience there was, they had some mental experience. I, I don't doubt lots of mental life can exist outside consciousness, but the reason they can't tell you about it is because that mental experience wasn't conscious, wasn't in the language, wasn't in language, and therefore they don't really have conscious access to it. Now, the uh, more troubling ones to me, I mean, again, I think a good philosopher would chop this down in a minute, but uh, um, uh, are, are uh, um, babies. My, my colleague, Alison Gopnik, will tell me I'm a nut job that Babies are extremely conscious. Uh, they're hyper-conscious. They're more conscious than adults. And certainly if I, um, I have my first grandchild now, um, he's six months old. He's um, actually spending part of the pandemic living with me. And um, uh, he certainly seems conscious. I mean, I'm trying to play with his consciousness all the time and going, you know, Oscar, over here, over here. No, Oscar, over here, over here. Uh, um, so I'm acting as though he's got good consciousness. I want to be the center of his consciousness and make him laugh and stuff. Um, so, uh, but that, you know, it doesn't go much beyond that argument. I mean, you could say, and, and you know, if I'm pushed against the wall, I'll say, well, no, uh, the fact that uh, none of us can really remember much of our lives before the age of five or six is an argument that you didn't really have consciousness when you were in the formation years of your language. Uh, and that's that's the reason you can't access it is because you can't access it consciously because you're accessing it through the linguistic system and that wasn't well developed. And so those memories you have, I don't doubt they're stored. I don't doubt, you know, we have a lot of memories from when we were, evidence suggests that, you know, memories get wired in there, but the problem is accessing them. And so I think those, Memories from when I'm one year old are in my brain. They're shaping my behavior. They're having an unconscious influence the way so many things have an unconscious influence, but uh, I'm not sure how, you know, I, it's a puzzle, right? Why we can't consciously access those memories. And one argument might be because they aren't coded in the language of consciousness. I, I could push it even further um, and include the problem of free will. I uh, think I heard you talk about um, the view that um, free will and consciousness are after the fact accounts. We try to give a narrative to behaviors that are somewhat preconditioned or um, so to speak, pre-established. And we were not 100% aware or, or we didn't have 100% free will to do what we think we did uh, per per personally 
with a purpose, purposefully. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but then language and consciousness uh, comes up and try to give an account, um, a narration uh, that makes sense to us. Do you think um, these ideas are in the right track according to your experience? Yeah, okay. So um, at least three comments on that. So, uh, um, uh, um, so first the interpretation notion. So, um, uh, that, you know, others have argued it, Mike Kazanik has made, I think, a very strong argument about that. Um, you know, uh, we have, he calls it the interpreter, and he's a little vague about, is the interpreter consciousness or any different things? And, and that's his notion about, you know, from working with a split brain patients about fundamental differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And he wants to say that, the left hemisphere is going to observe things and make a coherent story, right? There's strong drives that we want to have a unity of our personality. We want to think that we are this one acting causal agent in the world and that interpreter is what sort of makes sense of all the things we do. And we know we have lots of different motivations and drive, but we still want to have some sort of sense of, you know, who is Rich Ivory and that interpreter is doing that. Um, in Mike's view, I think he would say that that probably is consciousness, that interpretation. I think he would say that that's separate of language. So the interpreter is kind of interpreting, putting coherence to all those things. Language might be one way to read out that interpreter, but I think he would say that the interpreter isn't intimately tied in with language. So I just want to make that distinction. Uh, the second one is that at some level, I think it's almost obligatory that something that pushed us on the direction, pushed me on the direction to pick up this coffee cup happened well before my brain was aware of it or I had the thought to pick up the coffee cup because you know, neurons don't just flip from one state to another or consciousness doesn't. We know neurons are gonna always be the accumulation of things that eventually might converge into a coherent pattern or cross a threshold or so forth. And so there always had to be something that was happening before, you know, I had to reach some threshold before I decided I'm gonna pick up that coffee cup. It didn't come out of nowhere. So there had to be something happening before that. So if you take it to that level, then there actually, I think has to be, you know, those decisions are, free will or interpretation of it is lagging behind, okay? So many aspects of our actions, our consciousness, you know, don't lack, they lack free will in the strong sense that we think about free will. On the other hand, I think um, I can, my conscious decision of something can have a huge impact on, you know, those actions. I can, you know, uh, um, I can go to pick up that go to pick up that coffee cup, and you can yell at me and say, "Don't pick up that coffee cup." And I can make that decision. Okay, I'm going to obey that order. Okay, so um, uh, I think I, I know that's a little bit mushy on an answer, but I think that at some level there must be, you know, kind of very simple physiological things that are going to propel us down the path to make the choices we make. And if you think that you know we didn't will ourselves to head down that path, but it was the ensemble of all the neural activity, you know, I, there was a little bit of a drive, my mouth's a dry or something, all those things, you know, converge on, oh, let's activate that motor pattern, pick up the coffee cup. I think a lot of that probably is set in motion before I have that idea like, hey, I think I'm gonna exert my free will and, and pick up the coffee cup. I think, I mean, again, just so much of our mental life takes place without consciousness. And, you know, that's why I'm, I'm never convinced by the, um, you know, appeals to uh, animal cognition, like, you know, your dog conscious or not. We know that you can get lots of complex behavior out of systems without having to think about consciousness. Just to round up, um, I promise <laughs> this is the last. No, 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 keep going, keep going. <laughs> uh, uh, lovely gets chatted up. Let's speculate that at some point, cognitive neuroscience um, is able to reach the point at which we do finally have strong evidence to support the idea that language and, cons and consciousness 
are intimately connected and, and even probably um, two sides of the same coin. Um, if we were ever to reach such a uh, um, state of affairs uh, in cognitive neuroscience, um, do you think the work of Antonio Damasio could be enlightening for English teachers like us? Would it be valuable for us to study what Antonio Damasio has said about consciousness if language and consciousness were to be such two uh, connected phenomena, uh, manifestations of, of the same underlying system? Yeah, so, um, so again, uh, just to frame that a little bit more even, is that um, most of the work on sort of the neural basis of consciousness um, in fact, I'm not sure if any of it, but none that I'm aware isn't actually pursuing the language consciousness link in any way. I think uh, the mainstream is looking for very, very different sorts of neural explanations. Um, you know, you have uh, folks like Damasio might think about, you know, uh, consciousness is kind of reflecting the contents of kind of early perceptual systems, that that's sort of a privileged readout from consciousness. Others, you know, like to think about um, consciousness as an emergent state when you have coherence of activation across different regions of the brain. So, uh, and, and there's some very, you know, very cool experimental work going on in that front. And most of that stuff has very, very, has nothing really related to any special status about language, right? They're looking at coherence between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, right? They're not even looking at kind of so-called language centers or areas intimately associated with the language. They're looking about areas associated with goal-oriented behavior and attention and so forth. And, and that, and, and, you know, showing that, you know, people's conscious experience is correlated with, you know, patterns of stability and shifts of patterns of stability in those parts of the brain. So, uh, um, so that, uh, that kind of work, um, you know, would probably say that, you know, if those avenues became fruitful, they probably would say that, you know, it's not that critical for, you know, English teachers in high school to think about those sorts of data right now. If you took the other extreme, you know, this, you know, weird one, and I want to say it's really an outlier about intimate links between language and consciousness. Uh, then, of course, I guess I haven't thought about this, but um, you might come up with a hypothesis that, hey, if we build language skills, we're building consciousness skills. And uh, that would be probably a pretty good thing, right? I mean, we certainly do all sorts of training to try to enhance consciousness, focus, you know, meditation traditions are built on that. Um, so, I mean, I haven't thought of that. I mean, I, I don't want to be quoted saying that I think uh, uh, people who are well-educated and, you know, have advanced language skills are more conscious than others. So, uh, um, you know, you're, you're suggesting that that might be a, a uh, a claim I would make, and, and maybe it's true. I, I haven't thought about it. Uh, I, you could imagine that, you know, language and consciousness, you know, once you have rudimentary language skills, I still can have the full conscious experience. I can still describe things. I might not describe them, you know, as eloquently, but it doesn't mean my ex perceptual, my experience wasn't as rich. So uh, uh, it may be like there's sort of a ceiling there that conscious and language go together, but the embellishments aren't in a sense increasing your consciousness. I keep increasing my vocabulary, but consciousness has sort of reached its its upper bound, its, its, its maximum sort of state, or it's indistinguishable. The extra words aren't really enhancing that, but it's actually uh, an interesting idea. I mean, um, you know, uh, do novelists, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, with their you know beautiful use of language, do they have a, a richer experience of the world, which would be like kind of a richer conscious experience? I mean, right? I, I'm not a writer. Am I a bad writer because I don't have the language, or am I a bad writer because I don't perceive things in a very rich way? I'm not a, a really great visual guy or something, and that limits what I can talk about because. I'm just not appreciating all the beautiful things that a great novelist, you know, picks up on all those subtle things that they, they, they fold into their narrative. And maybe their conscious experience is quite a bit richer and that's actually a key for making a great writer. It's an interesting uh, idea. I mean, 
really thought about the look at the other end instead of looking at the paucity of consciousness you know in people without language but actually look at the uh, uh, richness of, of consciousness in people with rich language <laughs> yeah uh, i'll just finish with this just to add um uh in favor of this argument prodi i think they, they are called prodigy children or gen genius children uh they usually start speaking at about i think six or eight months um, probably even earlier, while most of us start speaking or uh, uttering our first words probably at the age of one year old. So that that's quite interesting. We have two more um, questions, I think. If, if you have time for this, because I guess you are you are close to your you're getting closer to your dinner time. Uh, but if we could just tackle these last questions um, from Alexandra Seron, what implications would that have for multi? Multilinguals. Uh, I don't know if you would like to uh, say anything about that. Yeah. So, um, um, so uh, um, I don't know about the consciousness part. Um, I mean, it would have implications. You can just sort of extend to that. But the whole Warfian notion um, has been studied. Uh, um, some beautiful experiments by people like Casan Santo. I don't know if he spoke about any of that, but um, his former. Um, I guess postdoc advisor Lara Boroditsky and others have studied that, and in you know the same way we've taken one individual, two brains, left and right hemisphere, as a within subject manipulation. I've said there's lots of advantages to the within subject approach. Um, they've taken a within subject approach in bilinguals, and they will do things like take people who are bilingual. I think. Um, one of their experiments was with uh, um, Russian speakers, but they have also ones with Spanish speakers and do, you know, not our exact task, but something very close to that basic color searching task I described, but they'll tell the bilinguals, they'll come in, They're, these are, you know, fluent bilinguals and they'll have them sit down and they'll have an experimenter who speaks to them in Russian and only talks to them in Russian. They do the task, okay? Then they come in and do it another time and they only speak to them in English. And you get these Warfian effects as a function of whether the person was thinking in Russian or thinking in English. So just the experimenter talking to the person and putting on their Russian thinking brain can then change how they perform on these perceptual tasks compared to when they speak in English, you know, like I said, in Russian, they make a extra color distinction between light blue and dark blue. And you can see these kinds of so-called Warfian effects when they're doing the task in a Russian mindset than when they're doing the task in the English mindset, even though again, the task itself makes no reference whatsoever to the words. It's just the act of speaking to them in the instruction phase, put them into their bilingual, uh, into the mindset of one, of one language. and. You know, now you get the, you know, in my post-perceptual account, now you get the activation of the irrelevant uh, word cues and those irrelevant word representations are going to be specific to the language you're thinking in. And, and I guess that it's difficult to separate um, limits, the fuzzy limits, the blurry limits between perception and conception, right? Uh, as, as yeah, you... well, um. I don't know if I, I agree. I mean, that, that's where I think um, we use the word perception in a fuzzy way, not as a criticism. It's just part of the metaphor. It's an interesting thing of the metaphors of language. But um, I think as, as uh, uh, you know, researchers, we can then take the tools of cognitive psychology and say, hey, those people have like, you know, thought about how you separate perception versus post-perceptual things. And, you know, here's some of the ways people have done it you might, might not be convinced by them but uh you know that that's sort of the challenge of, of cognitive psychology is to say let's take that term recognize that this is a perceptual task but a perceptual task doesn't mean everything we see is due to perception it could come and, and it's, it's like i say I, I use that that stroop example again when i see the word green printed in red ink okay I know I get the activation of that irrelevant word green, but I don't think it changes the color of the red ink, okay? It slows down my performance. So I have a 
impairment on that perceptual task. I'm slower when the two are incongruent, but I don't think, you know, in that thought experiment that people are claiming that the perception itself has been changed there. It's this post-perceptual account, like the Simon effect type thing. Yeah. So yeah, it just means we have to be precise in you know how we operationalize things and do our experiments. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is the last question, and then we'll let you have your dinner uh, reach. <laughs> so Alexander Thoron again. Uh, since we agree that our perception perception of the world depends on the language we speak, does that mean that our consciousness somehow depends on that too? And if so, can it differ from our one language speakers to another language speakers, and thus can we even have one and only definition of a consciousness? Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, um, so we're totally into the speculation phase here. Um, uh, if um, you know, if I say language equals consciousness, and my uh, language is you know changing my conception of the world, then yes, I would say that uh, our consciousness would be different in the two. If you take that alternative I just sketched here um, to say that, you know, whereas language consciousness emerges as we develop language, but, you know, we only need so much language ability to have kind of a full conscious experience and additional language just gives us a richer way to describe that experience. Then you might expect in both languages that I've hit that same sort of ceiling and now the consciousness is sort of indistinguishable between language one and language two. So I'm giving you kind of two sketches about why you might think in one case, the extreme would be that the consciousness is different and the other one. Um, again, if I go by that memory distortion, we come back to that glass of wine I'm about to have, uh, we know that um, the language is gonna shape your perception Okay, I mean, your memory, right? You're gonna, in Spanish, you're gonna not be sure, did Rich spill the glass of wine or did someone else? Because you know it was spoken about the next day as the glass of wine was spilled without naming the person. And that's gonna have an effect on how well you can recall that incident. Then you tell another friend about, oh, it was this crazy dinner party, this glass of wine was spilled. Uh, um, uh, isn't that, Changing your conscious experience, your recollection, your isn't your you know conscious your memories about you know what you conscious you know when you ask someone to tell you someone else about something aren't you telling them about your conscious experience and you know if you've kind of forgotten because of the lack of the agent and the description there led to you forget who did the spilling it seems like that has changed your 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 awareness of that of that event. Thank you so much, Rich. It's yeah. already two minutes to nine o'clock over here in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, some of our teachers are quite probably tired and you are quite close to your dinner time. Um, it, your dinner time? Uh, what time is dinner time there? And you know, a nine o'clock dinner person? <laughs> <laughs> That's Spanish, not Mexican, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we'll leave it there, but I am so really grateful that you have honored us with this lecture. It's really been such a wonderful time. Two hours uh, that went like two minutes for me. Yeah, yeah, that was a real pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, very fun to talk about these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. And I would just like to ask our uh, attendees to please say goodbye to you. Uh, Podrían, por favor, despedirse del... Doctor. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Professor. It was a great, great talk, and, and it was really uh, um, enlightening for me. And uh, from now on, I'm going to work more in critical thinking. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Uh, that's, yeah. that's nice for everything. Of course, <laughs> I am taking, I, uh, we are taking a course with uh, Sergio about uh, cognitive grammar. We're taking, he's giving us a course. And that's, uh, it's a very interesting course that we're taking there. Uh, and well, it's, it's nothing easy. It's really, really complicated that. Ah, well, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you guys are joining this uh, speaker series. You got such a uh, uh, motivated reader there who uh, yes. doesn't let go if you uh, uh, show any indication of uh, uh, an interest in joining the, the group. But, it, uh, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's amazing to have uh, 70 people uh, uh, sit through a two hour lecture at this hour of the day. So it, it clearly a sign that, you, you know, the folks are, uh, have a great interest in the topic. Great. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.
Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank good you so much. Good night. See good you, Rich. Good night. Thanks a lot. See you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, nice seeing you. you. Bye. Sergio, shall we be able to listen to it again? Bye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say that, that somebody asked if, if there was any chance to uh, listen to the lecture again. I'm going to load it to YouTube. Uh, it's already in YouTube. And I'm going to make some adjustments so that the chattering from the beginning is not there anymore. Uh, but I think you will have the lecture available on YouTube by tomorrow morning at about, I don't know, maybe 10 o'clock. So, yeah, um, and I'll send the links. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you all for being here. I'll see you later, and thanks so much for thank being you, here. Thank you, Sergio. See Goodbye. You. Good, good night. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.